<laughs> Thanks for that song. That was that was our psalm for this morning. So we'll we'll actually read it in a second. Um, but first, we we're almost done with this psalm series, if you can believe it. Um, and one of my favorite parts of this series has been hearing some of the psalms that you guys all wrote. So I get to share one of those with you this morning, um, if I can get it out without knocking everything over. Um, so this is a psalm from one of you. So thanks to the psalmist for writing it for us. It says, Here I stand beside still waters, in desolation feeling all alone. Where are those who have gone before us? Are they in your presence now, radiant and glorious? I dare to seek your peace. When silence is unbroken, void of voices of the aged, lost in the unknown, speak sweet words, my king adored, risen all victorious. How long must I await comfort in the darkness and grope for your amazing grace where once bright light had shone? Hear the praises of the children and peals of joyous laughter as their gracious love outpours, heed my supplication. In the midst of life's travails, I call on your name. Bless the souls of friends and kin to the heavenly realm now sown. I sing to Almighty God who finds me at my weakest. I claim your hope when all seems lost, drawn into your mighty station. When you meet me on the other side of loneliness, then you seat me on the other side in holiness. Lord, you greet us on the other side. Isn't that beautiful? That's a great one. So thank you to our psalmist this morning. Um, our psalm from scripture is from Psalm 42. Um, so if you have a Bible with you or on your iPad or phone or something or can reach one, um, go ahead and turn with me to Psalm 42. Give you a second. It'll sound a lot like the song we just heard. It says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Mount Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for these words from Psalm 42. And we ask that you teach us from them this morning, teach us more about who you are and who we are as your people. In your name we pray, amen. So I don't think I have ever been more homesick than when I left for college. Now I know that there are a couple of people with kids looking at colleges or going to college soon, Dakota, uh, so I don't mean to scare you. But when I left for college, I was terrified. I made lots of really intentional decisions about where I was going to go to school and why, and I decided, you know, for me, I needed to branch out from high school. There was one college in particular that 30% at least, usually more like 50, of every graduating class in my high school went to this one college. So I knew, okay, I don't want to go there. <laughs> I wanted to branch out a little bit. I loved my high school friends, and high school was a lot of fun, but I didn't want four more years of it. I wanted to meet people from different places in the country and from different places in the world, and it's clear how that turned out for me. <laughs> I married one of them. <laughs> but I wanted new experiences and new places, but oh my goodness, did that terrify me. 
I was so scared to go and to actually act on these choices I had made. <laughs> I chose a school that was eight hours away from my parents, about 12 hours away from where all my friends were going, and I knew two people. One was my older brother, who happened to stay there after he graduated. <laughs> but that was it. And I remember on the day that I left for college, I was just a complete mess. And I remember in tears saying to my mom, how am I supposed to just brush my teeth and pretend like it's any other day? <laughs> how do you do this? And when we got there and my parents, my parents drove me there and they went back home and I just felt so alone. I didn't know anyone, I didn't know where I was going. The college where I went to had lots of really huge Dutch names for all the buildings, like Spoolhof Center and Heminga Hall, and I didn't know how to say these crazy words. And <laughs> there was all kinds of stuff I didn't know, and all I wanted to do was go back home to my dog and my bed and my house and the people I knew and the places I knew. I wanted to go where I felt safe and comfortable. But deep down, I knew that if I were to do that, I wouldn't grow the way that I felt like God needed me to grow in those four years of college. But man, was I homesick. You see, Psalm 42 is a prayer of someone who's homesick. It might not seem like it at first glance, so bear with me. We're going to dig into a little bit of history <laughs> to get to the bottom of this. But this was written by someone who was homesick. So you see, the writer of the song, we don't know who he is other than he was a son of Korah. Um, but he, he apparently lives in this place called the Land of Jordan, which is kind of an Old Testament way of saying near the source of the Jordan River. And that's up near Mount Hermon and Mount Mizar. And we know this from verse 6, where the psalmist writes, My soul is downcast within me. So I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Mount Hermon and Mount Mizar. Now I have a map to show you. This is, I'm the daughter of a history buff and a teacher, so here's this all coming together for you. But <laughs> Deborah, if we can see the map. I know you can't really see the words, so I'm gonna move. After Jeremy told poor Dave doing the video that I don't move around a whole lot when I talk, I'm gonna go way over here. <laughs> so I know you can't see the words very well, but way up on the top, is Mount Hermon, way up north. And that's where our psalmist lived. Now, what was a big deal about this is that Jerusalem, which is kind of the heart of life in the Old Testament, especially for the believers, is way down here. So he lived way up where I can't even reach. And all of life, for all of the other believers, was kind of centered way down here. Now, there are hints that the psalmist used to live in Jerusalem. In verse four, it says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God, the temple, which is in Jerusalem, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. The temple was, the temple was in Jerusalem and it's where people would go and worship and there were festivals. And so the way that he writes about it um, seems to suggest that he lived there before. So at one point he lived way down south and then he moved way up north. And it doesn't seem like a huge deal to us. We move all the time. I've moved four times in six years. Um, so it's, it's not that big a deal to us, but for the psalmist, it would have been huge to move so far away from Jerusalem, that center of life and where the temple was. And the reason it was such a big deal was not because well, probably partly because all they had to move with were donkeys and camels, right? Not U-Haul or the starving students moving company or whatever. Um, but he had to go on foot. But more than that, where, where the temple was in Jerusalem, that's where Old Testament believers believed that God lived, literally, physically. God lived in the temple. And so they believed that if you went away from the temple, or if you couldn't get to the temple, you couldn't get to God. That's how our psalmist understood it. So when he says, he has this question, um, when can I go and meet with God? You can hear this deep, profound longing, because he really doesn't know the answer. When is he ever going to get from the top of that map towards the bottom of that map to meet with God? 
And when people are taunting him, it says in the psalm, saying, where is your God? He kind of has to answer, well, he's hundreds of miles that way. <laughs> he's not here. I don't have access to him. And there's lots of language about hungering and thirsting for God, and that makes sense because he, as far as he understands, the psalmist understands, he can't get to God. And he's longing for that. And he's longing for home where he was comfortable and knew how to get to God. He felt like he was far away from God, far away from the center of life in Jerusalem, and he missed it. You can hear it in the song. He longed to be back home. Now the thing is, you can read throughout the Old Testament that God couldn't really be contained to the temple, right? You can read lots of stories of God being with the people even away from the temple. The temple at some point gets destroyed, and God is still with his people even though there's no temple. You can read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah if you want to. Um, and we read stories of God being with the people who Israel believed were pagans and lived outside of the city, and God was with them too. God couldn't be contained to this box. But our psalmist hadn't quite gotten there yet. He understood that God was in the temple, God was in the city where he used to live, and now he was miles and miles away, way north. So he was way north from God, with no access to him. And he was homesick. He longed for what he used to know. You can take down the map now, Deborah. Thanks. Maya Angelou wrote in her work, All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes, this about home. She said, The ache for home lives in all of us, the safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. Home is safe, right? Home is comfortable. It's somewhere where we know what to do, we know how to act, we know the language and the culture. Maybe for some of us, we're even in charge of that language and culture. We're the head of the household, so to speak. When I think of home, I picture myself, you know, putting on some comfy sweatpants and crawling onto the couch with a blanket and watching a movie with my husband and my dog. It's comfortable, and it's safe, and it's easy. That's home. So to be homesick is essentially to be afraid of what's not so comfortable. Right? To be homesick is to long to go back to that safe space because we're scared of all of these uncomfortable, unfamiliar, not-so-easy things that surround us. And that's what our psalmist is experiencing. And of course, it's a very natural thing, right? We want to be comfortable. We want to feel natural in our surroundings. We like home. Home is good. But as Max Lucado once wrote, and maybe this is a little cliche, but Max Lucado once wrote, God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. And I'm sure you've heard that before. It's been around for a while, but if we stay too long at home, we can't really be stretched or grown or transformed. If we stay too long in this little box that we call home where we're comfortable and it's always easy, it's hard for God to get to us, because we're too comfortable. Sometimes we need to step out of that box to grow. Homesickness can almost become a kind of regression, you know, where we so long to get back to where we're comfortable, that we take a step back in what God is doing in our lives and the way that we've grown and changed throughout the years. If we let ourselves get too deep into homesickness, we can cut ourselves off from this work of transformation, making us a new creation that God wants to do within us and through us. And maybe that's especially true when it comes to our faith and our spiritual lives. I think we often, or at least I often, make these little boxes to put our spiritual life in. You know, over here, this is my church box. This is where I worship and sing and pray and have church fellowship, and then over here are all my other boxes, maybe my work or my family or my favorite hiking trails or something. And as long as they're separate, then I can be comfortable and safe and it's not too scary. Or maybe we, we build these Jerusalems for ourselves, these places where we decide this is where God lives, this is where I understand what to do and how to do it, and there's no way that God could ever be present over here 
outside of this Jerusalem, this box that I've built. For some of us, for example, maybe we build Jerusalems out of styles of music and worship. Maybe we want more drums or less drums or no drums at all. And if there's too much drums, then I just can't worship. Or maybe we want more hymns or more new songs or more young people on the stage or let's leave that to the real Christians, the adults over 35. <laughs> or, you know, there's all these boxes we can build, all these Jerusalems we build. I confess one of the Jerusalems that I've built is I'm not comfortable in worship services that only use hymns on the organ. I'm just not comfortable with it. I, I tend to shut off. I, I guess I've had experiences in churches before where they've done worship like that and it just felt dead to me. And so I turn off, but what I do then is say, there's no way God can be in the organ. There's no way God could possibly speak to me through his words or change his people or teach us about him through the hymns on the organ. God has to be over here with guitars and piano and drums and the things that I like. <laughs> and I shut myself off to whatever God would try to do or say or teach me in that moment. So there's my confession to you. But there are, there are lots of Jerusalems that we build in the church. Sometimes we build Jerusalems over the people in our church. Not this church, of course, all those other, other churches out there. But <laughs> sometimes we build Jerusalems out of people. You know, if they don't look like me, if they're not my race or age or have the same life experiences or make as much money as me, it's just too uncomfortable. We can't be together in fellowship. There's no way God can be in this area that's too uncomfortable for me. Sometimes we even build Jerusalems out of the kind of ministries or activities we'll do in our church. You know, we might say, oh, I'd love to get involved with ministry for people who already believe. But as soon as someone comes who isn't quite sold on this Jesus thing, it's too much for me. I'm out. <laughs> There's no way God can be in it then if it's too uncomfortable. Or we might say, we'd love to do ministry with adults in my age bracket. You know, for me, that would be late 20s to early 30s. For some of us, it would be 40s, 50s, whatever our age bracket is. And then we might say, you know, I don't want to deal with children or teenagers or senior citizens. Don't bother me with that. That's not where I'm comfortable. God can't be there. God's over here, where I'm at home, where I'm comfortable and safe. And we do this so many ways, at least I do this so many ways in the church. We build these Jerusalems and these little homes where we're safe and believe that God couldn't possibly be outside of this Jerusalem. But if we never leave that box, if we never let ourselves go to where we're uncomfortable, then we run the risk of shutting ourselves off to what God would do or say or change in us through that discomfort. Sometimes it takes a little bit of fear of homesickness for us to, to have our guard down enough for God to work. That's what our psalmist is going through this morning. And I think we can learn a huge lesson from the psalmist in Psalm 42. I really admire the psalmist in this psalm because he doesn't let himself get bogged down in his homesickness. It's not that he doesn't feel it, you know, he talks about his tears have been his food and um, you know, soul is downcast and all of this very sad kind of language. But he also has this kind of bold determination not to let it stop him from doing what God has next. In verse 6, he says, My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. From the land of Jordan, from Mount Hermon, in this place that's new and uncomfortable, where I miss my home, because I'm downcast, that's why I'll remember you, the psalmist says. He says, I long for you. I want you to meet me here, where I am, even if it's not comfortable. There's this beautiful determination. At the end of the psalm, he says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him. It's like he's determined to praise and worship and put his hope in God, no matter what, 
no matter where he is. And you can almost hear when he asks himself the question, why are you so downcast, my soul? It's like he's saying to himself, hey, snap out of it. Put your hope in God. Praise him even now when you're uncomfortable or even sad and downcast. It doesn't matter if you're in Jerusalem, down south, or way north in the land of the Jordan. Put your hope in God. That's what the psalmist says to us this morning. He decides, deliberately and intentionally decides, to put his hope in God. Even in the midst of this discomfort and homesickness and longing for what's safe, he makes a decision. He's out of his comfortable box of home. He's out of Jerusalem where he knows what to do and how this whole faith thing works. He remembers being there, but he's gone now and he decides, even now, I will praise you, my Savior and my God. I think it takes that kind of deliberate decision making to get us out of our comfortable homes. I know it does for me. I think we have to decide to follow God out of where we're comfortable into whatever he has for us next so that he can really get his grip on us and transform us and change us into this new creation that Jesus promised we would be. But we've got to let go of that comfort for that to happen. We have to intentionally step out of our homes, out of our little boxes, our Jerusalems, for that to happen. I don't think that means that comfort is a bad thing. And I don't think that that means we have to be uncomfortable forever, all the time. But I think at least for a season, God calls us to take that step and to trust him beyond the walls of our comfort, whatever that looks like, so we can be changed. And if we do that, we'll be made better for it. It might hurt. It might be uncomfortable, it might make us feel sad or homesick, but we will be better for it in the end. So friends, what are your Jerusalems? Where are those areas where you've decided, this is where God lives over here. This is where I'm comfortable. There's no way God can be over here. What are those places for you? What? In what areas of your life do you need to step out of your comfortable box of home so God can really get a hold of you and work his transforming power in you? I challenge you this week, and myself too, I'll do it too. Just ask God those questions. Ask God to show you where you need to get out of your comfort for a little while so he can work in you and see what he says, and then see how he empowers you to actually do it with his help. Amen? Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for this challenge. Uh, we don't like to be uncomfortable. I don't like to be uncomfortable. But we know that sometimes it's in discomfort that you can work in us, like you showed the psalmist. And Lord, we ask that we would leave this place transformed and more like the people you would have us be. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.